So one guy came up to me. He had like a kind of a trench coat on a big coat, reached into his jacket, pulled out a pistol and stuck it in my face. He said, give me all your shit. And I remember being terrified, you know, right away. Holy shit. Okay. I don't want to die. All right, Nick, thank you so much for joining me today. Artie, thank you for having me, man. I'm excited. This has been a long time coming. Looking forward to uh, to having a good conversation with you. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we met on X or Twitter, as a lot of people still understand it to be. Um, and you host a lot of spaces on there and you're a writer. But why don't you dive into a little bit about who you are so that listeners that aren't on X and don't know you have a little bit more of a background? Right on. Yeah. So um, I mainly hang out on X these days. Uh, I My sort of identity as a creator is always changing, but right now I would say I'm mostly a writer. That's what I'm pouring most of my time and attention into. That's what I'm most passionate about. I also host Spaces. I don't know if you've mentioned those on previous episodes, if people yeah. are familiar with them, but Spaces are kind of like Clubhouse. They're audio-only meetings where we have a host and People are invited up on the stage to talk, and that's something that I, I do at least one a week that I host, and I join all sorts of other spaces. That's where we met. Had a lot of really good conversations on there. Um, and outside of that, I also have my own podcast, Laughing Stoic Buddha, uh, that I'm up to over 70 episodes now at this point. I've been doing it sort of sporadically for about four or five years. Uh, so yeah, as far as what I do on the creative side is I write. Um, mostly on X. I have a newsletter by the same name as my podcast, Laughing Stoic Buddha. And uh, I do podcasts. And I just really, if, to condense it down even more, even more concise, I try to write and have the most meaningful conversations that I can. Awesome. Uh, space is where we met is like such a cool thing, I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't have that on any other platform. Like, If you have a YouTube channel, you can have people writing to you while you're going live or something like that but there's nothing quite like spaces where people can just join a conversation they can be people that are following you or they can be random people that you're not connected to but maybe they saw somebody jump in your space and it popped up on their feed um how long have you been doing spaces for yeah i've i've been hosting i always keep track because i i change the number every week i just finished my 25th week in a row of right. hosting a space and then I had joined a couple of spaces maybe a week or two before that. So um, more than half a year now, more than six months, uh, been regularly joining spaces. And I think I pretty much join at least one a day. Um, just It's almost like a little habit. Like I just, you got to just jump on <laughs> at least one space, talk to some of my buddies. And you get so close. I mean, these people that you, I, I totally agree with you that nothing quite measures up on any other social platform where it's so open. You can talk to super high creators that have, you know, a million followers one day. You can talk to somebody else who just it's their first week on on X, you know, on, on maybe even on the same space. And so it's very intimate. Um, you get to know each other really well. And when you sort of end up in little circles, like uh, you and I have somewhat, I have other people that I talk to almost damn near every day on, you know, their space, my space, or somebody else's space that they're hosting. Uh, these are people that I'm t I'm spending more time with than some of my my real life friends, you know, the, the, that I even work with or whatever. Uh, so yeah, spaces have been a real reality changer for me. It's opened up my world to what relationships are, what friendships are, what networking connection is, and it was really something I I didn't really see coming in my life at all. But I, I really appreciate and. Um, I almost can't imagine my life without having spaces at this point because it just becomes yeah. so essential and integral to uh, to my lifestyle. Yeah, I've only, I've been doing a weekly space now and it's, I just did my fifth week. So I'm like still getting my feet wet in it, but it's so cool. Like you have, you know, followers on Twitter or connections, friends, whatever you want to call it. Followers is kind of a weird name, mm -hmm. um, but you have these friends on X and they see your post and they engage with your post maybe a bit, but nothing compares to when they jump in a space with you and you get to just talk to them and just have a back and forth that isn't curated. It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, like you, you can write something and, and say something and put it out there, but you get, it's about as real as you get when you get on a space and 
just talk with somebody and get to know who they are. And, and yeah, it's very a- organic, right? It's very yeah. like the closest to real life. You're not sitting there writing up a presentation, showing it to somebody, them, you know, writing some sort of a comment back. Like it's just, you, it's you run into somebody at a bar or at the park or something and you strike up a conversation. It feels like that to me. Like I said, it's the most real, it's sort of the most organic form of, of social media that there is, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's just people talking, you know, jumping yeah. on the phone. It's really cool. Yeah. I love it. I, it's such a town hall, not even town hall. It's just, a group, like you, a clubhouse, like you said. I mean, Discord is kind of similar, but Discord, you have to be in somebody's server. This is like, you can just be completely unattached to somebody and end up in their space. It's just mm-hmm. so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, with, uh, with Stoicism, how'd you get into Stoicism? Man, yeah, good question. Uh, Stoicism, God, it's sort of always been there. I think I read Meditations when I was like 18 years old. And I had this feeling that I'm sure we'll talk about a lot today, similar to when I first stumbled upon Alan Watts and I first started hearing about Eastern philosophy. I had this feeling when I first read meditations of, holy shit, this is stuff that I've always known or I've always like sort of felt like I, I knew, but I didn't hear anybody talking about very basic stuff, you know, and not, not super esoteric, not super out there, but just like, Oh, this is the way to live a good life. This is sort of the, the common problems that so many human beings have. And there's reasons that so many people have these common problems and there's ways to fix it, you know, and, and there, there's mindsets and practices and philosophies that you can apply to your life to fix, you know, falling into the same pitfalls as, as everybody else, you know, you see around you falling into. And the fact that it was written over 2000 years ago, uh, and that so much of it is applicable today really helped me to realize it's like tapping into something deeply human, even spiritual, that this is, you know, stoicism had cracked a certain code that, uh, is sort of timeless. And, um, so yeah, it really started for me at 18, but then I I sort of fell away from it for a while. I started reading, um, started getting back into it when Ryan Holiday first published, uh, The Obstacle is the Way. And then I, I, I read that book when it first came out, loved it. Um, and, and then it really, the, the latest wave was when I went through my divorce, mm. um, which was coming up on about four years ago. And I went back to stoicism that time out of necessity, out of like, I need, uh, a, uh, like a how to book to get through this. I need, you know, I need, I need the yeah. the directions because I'm, I'm going to lose it. I need, I need to lean on the greatest wisdom, um, of that I can get my hands on basically. Right. And stoicism seemed like exactly that because, you know, there's a lot of ways to summarize stoicism, but one of my favorites is learning to understand what you can control and what you can't control to control what you can as best as you can as, as equanimous and balanced and, and from a centered place as possible and to learn to let go of or accept what you can't control. And there's almost nothing more rough in, you know, the Western world for us than to go through a divorce. I mean, there's a lot of shit that's outside of your control yeah. that takes a lot of work to, um, to make peace with and then zeroing in on the little bit that you can control like when in my case was taking care of my health, uh, you know, taking care of my, my job, uh, spending the time that I was spending with my daughters, which is now cut down because I'm not living together with them anymore. You know, really getting the most out of that time that I spend with them. And, uh, again, all that really, I was leaning on the pillars of stoicism to get me through that. And then it just, it just got instilled in me, man. It's just like in my DNA now because it worked yeah. so damn good for me at that time when I really needed it. And now I'm in a much better place in my life, but it's just like, it, it, it's like, I don't really have a whole lot of notes that I refer to back on stoic stuff. Like it's just built inside of me, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's a way that I live day to day now. Well, it's interesting that you say you, you were already incorporating some of it and you already came upon some of the thoughts yourself. Cause I feel the same way about stoicism. Like it was, I was already talking about, uh, 
you know, control the things that you can control. There, there are certain things out of your control and you can't do anything about it. So why worry too much about it? I had been developing those mindsets for a while before I knew or heard the word stoicism. And it doesn't mean that I didn't learn some of that from stoics um, just unintentionally, but it's kind of funny how we uh, we're drawn often because you're a curious person. I'm a curious person. That's what this podcast is all about. And it's it's funny how you end up being drawn to the things that you're already coming upon yourself mm-hmm. without even having read certain ideas. It's it's often you end up reading somebody somebody's words, and it's like these are the feelings that I've had or the thoughts that I've had. They're just more well articulated by this person, or they're just more thorough in their thoughts on it. So it's just kind of funny how that is. Yeah, no, I completely agree, dude. It's one of my favorite experiences in life is when you are starting to come upon a new way of thinking and a new philosophy for yourself. And it's a little ethereal, it's a little messy and a little blurry. And then you come upon something like stoicism. You come upon a great writer or a great book. Yeah. And then it, it just brings this thing that you're already moving towards and just in such a clear and refined way, you know, and, and it's, yeah. it's one of my, my, my favorite things. It's funny because in stoicism in particular, certain people you'll talk to about it and they'll say, this is basic stuff. I already know that you control, you should try to control what you can control and, and, you know, accept what you can't or a lot of the ideas in stoicism. It's sort of basic. It's sort of, you know, uh, uh, pedestrian or whatever. And I always go, okay, that's cool. Go and read the book because these are ideas you think you got a handle on. But first off, are you applying it to your life? Well, there may be a reason that you're not able to really embody and apply it in your life. And go and read, like, that's what's great about Stoicism is we have first-person accounts, you know. Anything by Seneca, anything by Epictetus, by Marcus Aurelius, is is just, it's like poetry. It's so, they're amazing writers. I know a lot of these are obviously translators, so we've got to give a lot of credit to the, the those that translated them. Um, and again, it's so applicable to here today. So it's like, to me, it, it is a very basic and fundamental philosophy, but there's so much depth to it and it it makes it so much more accessible. You know, it's not like reading Nietzsche or uh, Carl Jung or, you know, something that's a lot harder to sort of wrap your brain around. Some people dedicate their entire lives to be able to do that. You know, me, I consider myself a blue collar philosopher. You know, I got a blue collar job. I'm I'm working in in the field as electrical engineer, Um, but I can pick up a, a, a book by any of these great Stoics, read a chapter and it actually changes the way that I'm able to show up today in my job as a father, you know, as, as a man day to day. And so that's, you know, that, that's what it's about to me, man. It's like finding the stuff that is the most clear, concise, and like something you can just apply right here in your moment to moment experience. Yeah. Well, and, and something being basic or something like that doesn't mean it's not worth going back to it and reviewing those thoughts because the most basic things are often the things that we ignore constantly. Yep. So like, Absolutely. you know, like everyone knows that you should, uh, well, I think most people know that we should treat the people close to us. Great. Like, but it's hard. Like it's a hard concept to put <laughs> yes. in practice Absolutely. because the people that we're closest to that we love the most are the people we also get the most frustrated with. So, you know, you have like I, my girlfriend and I will have little conflicts and it's like, I love her, but we also will get on each other's nerves and she'll get mad at me. I'll get mad at her. And you have to remember, like I'll read stuff about relationships and you you just are reminded of like, yeah, all these little, little conflicts don't matter. We need to focus on what is working because it's too easy to focus on the negative. So it's really good to have these constant reminders. I mean, that's why people write things on the mirror, like yes. things, like simple sayings. Mantras, to all that. Yeah. Yeah. What did it teach you about your divorce? And like, did it, when you reflect on your divorce, is there anything that, you, you don't have to share anything you don't feel like, but is there anything that you look back on and you're like, oh, I would have done that differently before the divorce or anything like that? Yeah, man. I mean, that's, 
a very loaded question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's good, man. This is what I like talking about. Um, I, my first ins, I go really on gut on this stuff, right? I've, I've sort of thought about that, but, but in this moment, my first instinct is the, when you go through something that's as rough as a divorce with kids involved, the fact that I'm on the other side, the kids are good. I have a civil relationship with my ex. I'm good. I kind of feel like there's really no room for regret because we made it and it's going to be messy and fucking complicated and rough all the way through (laughs) regardless. So, so I don't, really see a lot of benefit in going back going, well, I could have done this different. I could have done that different. Um, I'm a lot more forward thinking and like, okay, I want to learn whatever lessons, if there's anything that jumps out at me, you know, that uh, I, I want to make sure I don't make the same mistake in the future. I'm in a situation now where I'm um, living with a woman and we're considered getting married at some point. Um, so, you know, I obviously reflect on, on the, I was a completely different person when I got married at 21 years old. I'm 34 now. Um, but yeah, that, that, that comes, that's what comes to mind right away is there's not really any regret because of just the outcome, just the fact that I got through that very messy thing and everybody involved is good. Myself, my ex and and my daughters, um, and, and running it through the lens of stoicism. I think that that's a very, the stoics are very big on reviewing stuff, right? Especially, especially Seneca. He had that practice of evening reviews. That's something that I do uh, myself whenever I can. I'm not perfect, but when I have the time at the end of the day, I like to journal for a few minutes, just, you know, two or three minutes. Think about the day. Think about something that I was, that feels a little heavy, a little bit sticky. Maybe I had a bad interaction or, you know, uh, I had planned to work out that day and I didn't, or I had planned to eat better and I ended up, you know, having a little cheat meal or whatever. Um, and just sort of like working that out to just sort of like process it, just, just get it done, get it out of the way. Like, you know, sort of, Hey, I know that I shouldn't have done that. Most maybe one of the reasons that I did it, what can I do to avoid it again in the future? So I think reviewing in, in that way and, and all that is, is a very stoic practice. Um, but balancing that out with like not ruminating, yeah. Like, all, you know what I mean? Like, like really going like, okay, give it its due time. But I think, um, a lot of people, I think I sort of have a maybe natural proclivity to this. So, which is why I, I sort of consciously guard against it is I don't want to give the past too much time and attention. I want to have most of it focused here and now. I want to reflect on the future, you know, the best direction that I want to head towards and sort of steer my boat in that direction. But I want the vast majority of my time and attention and focused on here and now this day, living the best day possible. And, um, as long as like the karma feels pretty good, I feel like the books are balanced with all the people in my life in the past. I, I don't feel like I need to make amends with anybody. Everything's pretty damn balanced out. Then I'm not really ruminating on the past all that much. And so that's sort of a long winded way of tying stoicism into the idea of, of where I'm at now with going through my divorce. You know, I, I feel good about where I am. I don't feel like, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Like, uh, I don't feel like I got a fair, uh, 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 the bad end of the stick, like the Mm -hmm. short end of the stick. You know what I mean? I don't feel any resentment, you know, I don't feel resentment towards anything that happened. And I don't think that, I don't feel any guilt. Like I did any more damage than I could have in any which, which way, like we made it through it. And you know, that's, that's sort of where I'm at. So it's a good question, man. No one's ever asked me that. And I appreciate you yeah. giving me the chance to work that out. Well, 20, I mean, so you were married when you were 21 until about 30 and yeah. women tend to mature at a younger age than men. And our minds are always growing and developing, but I feel like I'm, I'm 38 and I feel like 20s is like a really big growing period for men. Yeah. I didn't really feel like a mature man until later into my 20s. So I feel like same <laughs> being married in your 20s is probably a lot to emotionally go through. Like you're, you're still growing, you're still changing, and you're trying to hold this very important relationship and kids, all this together. So... I'd imagine there's a lot involved there, a lot of, uh, it's heavy. It's just heavy. Yeah, no, it really is, man. And it's, um, 
it turned me into the man that I am today. So again, I don't have any regrets about it, but it, I, it'd be hard for me to suggest to any young man in his twenties to get married and especially have kids. Like, I, I don't think there's any magic number. Everybody matures at their own, you know, age and stuff. But for me personally, and for the people close to my life, I feel like 27, 28 is like the very beginning of when you actually are stepping into <laughs> what it means to be a man and maybe being ready to be a husband and a father also. Um, and, and for some people, it's even later than that, right? But yeah, yeah it's man ha- having getting, I got married at 21. I had my first daughter at 24 and, and it was rough. It was like boot camp. It was trial by fire, you know, yeah. and, and we made it through and everybody's healthy and, you know, okay. But it was, it was re- really, really hard. It's hard to articulate just how hard it was, you know. Yeah. And it's funny that you throw out the number 27, 28, because that's the number that always comes into my head as when I felt like, oh, I'm starting to understand this shit a little bit. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's, uh, yes. it seems like a pretty common phenomenon. Like that age right before 30 is like, okay, you're starting to figure things out. And, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, it's one of the reasons like I look and I, I have a ton of respect for people that join the military and, and put that time in there. Mm-hmm. But it, Usually going at the age of 18, 19. Yeah. You really still are a child. Yeah. You know? yeah. Your, your brain, I don't even think most brains are able to really comprehend what you're getting into at that point. Mm-hmm. Like I considered military at one point and I'm happy I didn't do it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure some things would have been good about it, but man, like 18, 19, 20. Yeah. <laughs> I don't rough. think you can really understand what you've been into. I'm no, sure I, some yeah. do, you know. Yeah. And again, it's, God, it's, it's a funny thing. Like you you almost have to make those crazy decisions before you know better <laughs> to yeah. like, you know, to maybe yeah. to be, become the kind of person that at 27, 28, 30 has all of those life experiences and then isn't even, you know, more fully developed, you know, full of wisdom and life experience and stuff like that. Right. Like yeah. I, there, there's some sort of funny, there's this joke, like, it's it's a joke. It's obviously you know not not it, as nuanced as the reality. But you know why why do young people go to war? And it's because because when you get old, you realize there's you know there's no reason to like like yeah. you can't talk old people into going to war, right? And yeah. so it, it, it's really something deeply kind of human about the fact that you get really young men that aren't the brains aren't fully developed. They don't have the life experience to realize what they're doing, and that's sort of the person that you need to go out there and protect you know, the society. Um, yeah. It's it's really an interesting, interesting philosophical idea, I think. Well, and, and you touch on something worthwhile there anyway, because I mean, a wise person is usually, I think, a person that's made a lot of mistakes before they were wise, yes. you know? Yes, I if, agree. If I have any wisdom, it's only because I've done a lot of the wrong thing my entire life. Same. And I've learned from that, you know? Yep. So. Yeah. No, absolutely, man. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, I've uh, again felt like I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been through some crazy shit. We haven't gotten into my childhood yet either. And I feel like I've earned whatever wisdom I've have for sure, you know, and yeah. I've gotten a lot of it through reading books and listening to great conversation, all, uh, conversations and all that. But I also like, like got the battle scars <laughs> from life and all this kind of stuff too, that I feel like is there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of depth to personal depth to my wisdom that I'm, that I sort of lean on in my lifetime. Yeah. Well, I get worried sometimes like on X, we we're around people who are older and younger and, and the same age, but I'll see people who are younger, like 18, 19, sometimes even younger than that. And they'll, they'll be talking about concepts of wisdom and, and learning and stuff like that. And I'll hear people say stuff like there's, no point in reading unless you're going to apply what you learn. Mm-hmm. And I think like, that's not really true, actually, because you're not going to apply something you learn about World War II, like yep. necessarily, right? Like you're not going to necessarily apply something that you learn. doesn't mean it's not worth learning. So it's like, there's nuance to things. And I see a lot of people approaching things in a non-nuanced way. It's like, yeah, you'll your mind has probably changed a little bit in 10 years, you know, I but gotta, you have to let people go through their life and figure things out. You know, I, I completely agree. I got to give a shout out to one of my favorite ex buddies, uh, Jamil, 
Hmm. Um, I, I can't remember how to spell his last name right now. He just wrote an article this week on exactly what we were talking about. And he's 24, uh, 25, but he's one of those pretty damn, very well read, yeah. very ahead of his age, mature guy. And he was talking about exactly that. The, the people on X that say, uh, you know, you have to, there's no reason to read anything unless you're applying, you know, every single thing that you get out of the books that you're reading. And, um, he had this really nice rant on why that's wrong, basically. Like very well articulated. I'll send it to you. Actually, I think you'd, you'd appreciate reading it. Um, but to that exact point of like, y- you go and read about co- the Soviet, you know, communist Russia. Go yeah. read about M- Mao. You're, it's going to give you such a depth of knowledge. It doesn't mean that you have to like go out and actively fight against communism, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, whatever, like, but it's going to give you a deep appreciation of human history, human psychology, you know, political, yeah. uh, dynamics, all of this stuff. And it, it's going to make you a much more wise person. It's, none of that stuff is actually applicable. And you can go and read, you know, the great, novelists and, and fiction writers of all time. Again, it's not something you're going to directly apply to your life right away, but it's going to give you a de- depth of like knowledge of human spirit and, and, you know, story and, and what it, what it means to be a human being across a lifetime. So I, I, that's something that really annoys me too, is like, it's this very like almost robotic, but you know, way of, of looking at life is every single thing that I read, I need to get an actionable thing. I need to go and do it. Like there's no soul to that to me. Like I'm very much on the side of like, you know, human spirit and soul first. And yeah. yes, actionable stuff is important too, but like you can only take so much action. Like it's, to me, it's a lot more about like the energy and, and, and the passion and then picking the couple of few right actions that are able to fuel you towards, you know, the direction that you want to go. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you read a book and there might be a hundred actionable things in a book. You're not going to take all 100 actions. You're going to take yeah. a few of them and that's okay. That's why you're going to read about the same concepts multiple times and, and take little pieces from everything. And plus not everything fits in your individual life. I, I just don't like that black and white thinking. And I feel like I don't, I don't know for sure if this is the case, but it seems like some of the red pill community is like, tries to base off stoicism, but they take mm-hmm. some of the concepts to too much of a black and white kind of thinking, you know, like yes. I'll see stuff about relationships. I'll see people say, you should never cry in front of your girlfriend or your girl. And I'm like, this, that's stupid, man. <laughs> like, yeah. you haven't been in a real relationship if you haven't cried in front of your girl. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Or you're a significant other because it doesn't have to be a girl. But, you know, mm-hmm. like you haven't been in a real relationship if you haven't cried with your significant other, I think. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that sentiment. And I also, um, yeah, I think the the red pill side goes just ha- hyper logical. Like yeah. I would almost say like hyper masculine, but I think the most masculine also is you're in touch with your feelings. You're in touch with your passions and all that. Mm-hmm. And, and something... I got a really good frame for stoicism that I was hearing on a space the other day actually was, so I believe the stoics aren't anti emotions, right? They're what they're anti is, is you should be able to feel everything. It's not about suppressing, you know, your emotions and, and, uh, put, put, putting them away in the closet. You should be able to feel everything, but what stoics are against is letting your emotions run you. So yeah. you're in control of your emotions. So that means you can feel, you know, anger and passion and happiness and joy and sadness and all these. But ultimately, it's about you taking responsibility for how you're going to act out out of those emotions, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think the 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 red pill side of things is like just suppress it all all the time. You know, be be a robot, be you know cold and 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 don't allow anybody to ever show that they're penetra- you know penetrating your emotions or your soul or any of that and i think it is i think it's toxic and it's 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 really uh, uh unfortunate because it might turn a lot of people off from true stoicism you know the yeah. sto- the stoicism that that yourself and i enjoy and is can be life changing and so i'm always every chance that i get trying to give the proper nuanced uh, side of stoicism, particularly as it applies to emotions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love nuance as a generality. Like I think approaching everything with nuance and curiosity is so important because life is complex. You don't want to put 
labels on everything and, and make something into, oh, you don't do this, you do do this. And it's like, life is complex. And, and you're right, like with stoicism, it's not about blocking off those emotions. It's about controlling your reaction. You know, you don't want to react because being angry in and of itself isn't something that's going to get you in trouble. It's reacting with that anger inappropriately. That's what's going to get you in, in trouble. And I mean, in trouble as in like ruin a relationship, potentially put you in jail. There's a lot of things reacting can do, but being angry, being angry itself, having that feeling is not something that's going to be destroying. You yeah, know? and in fact, if you don't allow yourself to fully feel those that anger and you suppress it, then it may bottle up and it may end up coming out anyway, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's funny you were talking about uh, reacting out of emotion. Another way that I like to frame stoicism is uh the ability to respond instead of react. Yeah. Right? Responding is coming from a, a balanced place, a, a a conscious choice, an intentional choice, a place of equanimity, you know? And reaction is, is not in your control. It's you feel something and you boom, you react, right? It just, you, you, you lash out, you, you have a split second you know, reaction. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, getting down to the, again, back to the feeling side of things. I think again, a true, just healthy psychological relationship with your emotions, a stoic relationship with your emotions is being able to feel those emotions, yeah. but keeping it here not letting it lash out into like, you know, verbal or physical or any sort of attack that's going to have some sort of long-term repercussions. But again, it's not about suppressing it. And I think yeah. we, we all know at this point that when you, when you suppress or you hide away, you don't allow yourself to feel something, it's going to come out eventually. And it, you rather have it be processed on your own terms than, you know, on life's terms. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you do want to let things go eventually too. Like, there's a one of my favorite Buddha quotes is uh, holding on to anger is like holding on to a hot coal and expecting the other person to get burned. Yep. You know, it's like you don't want to hold on to it for so long. It doesn't mean you can't feel that anger for a little bit and process that. You just don't want to hold on to it. And of course, you don't want to react negatively to it. Yeah. So let's talk about your childhood a little bit. You mentioned it. You you grew up in a cult. I want to hear about this because I only know a little bit about it. So, uh, yeah, dive into it. Okay, so I was born pretty much to a single mom. Um, my dad was kind of in the picture a little bit early on, took off uh, before I was two. This is a good story. Actually, the way that they met. So um, I was destined to be a hippie from the beginning. Because my dad was a was homeless, living in a van. On do you know anything about Berkeley, California? Uh, I don't, Cal, I don't. Cal, Cal Berkeley. What part I mean, of the world are you in? I'm in Utah. Utah. Okay, so I've been to San Francisco. You live in San Fran, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm across the bay from San Francisco. Yeah. yeah, Berkeley. So Berkeley is like maybe one of the most liberal hippie places in the world. Maybe even more than San Francisco. Uh, so I was born in 89. So in the late eighties, my dad was living out of a van and he was giving tarot card readings. You know about tarot cards? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was giving I tarot somebody that does tarot. Oh, right on. So, yeah. so my, my biological father is a bit of a master of tarot cards. He's like giving courses and he's, uh, been doing readings for like 50 years. So he was giving tarot card readings on the corner of, uh, Telegraph and Durant, which is right by UC Berkeley. And my mom stopped by to get a tarot reading from him, a tarot card reading from him. Gave him a reading. I don't know how you exchange phone numbers or whatever back in the day. This is way before social media and cell phones, but that's how they met. And I think she recruited him to actually come into the cult. She had been going to the cult for about a month at that point. And, uh, and they were together at that time. Um, I think they even lived together for a little bit. She got pregnant with me. And by the time she was pregnant with me, didn't work out with the dad. He took off. And he was kind of still sort of a little bit around. But anyway, I was born into the cult. Um, the cult is called SRF, Spiritual Rights Foundation. Um, it was run by, if you know anything about cults, uh, 
par for the course, a very charismatic leader that uh, sort of preyed on vulnerable people, people that had been gone through tragedies, you know, that uh, whether they're family tragedies or financial or just sort of down and out people promise them, you know, a way out, some sort of salvation. Uh, it was very uh, right for the time and place, late eighties, early nineties in the Bay area. It's like Chris, it was a Christian ish cult, but also a lot of metaphysics, a lot of uh, psychic readings and energy work and chakra Kundalini stuff. So it was a strange mixture of like, Christian, but also sort of the latest for the times metaphysics at the same time. Um, so my mom was involved with that for about two years before she had me. Um, the cult sort of supported her. The fact that my, my dad took off, they took care of her enough of like giving her a place to live, um, like a small room in the basement of this church. The church was a four story Victorian in, um, Berkeley. Um, and they had like little rooms and stuff like that, that certain people, if they weren't quite on their feet, could live inside of. And then basically in return, you dedicated every free minute you had that you weren't working there. So, you know, people took care of everything imaginable to run a community, you know, food and cleaning and business and, um, you know, just all of that. And all this work was for free. And this is part of what cults are really good at is they are able to convince people that they need to, you know, the best way to save your soul is to work for us, give us all the money that you can and give you all the free labor that you can to, you know, get promise yourself salvation on the other side of death. And so, um, she had a job, she got a, uh, a degree in sociology, a master's degree in sociology. She was going to be a professor. She had some tragedies happen in her life. She ended up in this cult and, you know, basically all of her future, career and and paths had got run down she ended up like cleaning houses basically to make a living so she was like house cleaner when she wasn't cleaning houses she was dedicating her time and attention to the cult and and then nick came along so i was born into this community um i was the youngest of there was three other older girls and then myself and that was like basically my entire friend group we part of the cult was you you didn't go to public school and you weren't really allowed to interact with anybody that was outside of the community. So it's very, uh, isolating, uh, you know, um, they kept you away from even family that wasn't accepting of the cult. So I spent a little bit of time with my grandpa growing up, but that was kind of it. I think cousins, nieces, nephews, uncles, aunts, none of that was really, um, you know, a part of my childhood. So it was, told that my family was this this community of people so yeah it's a really strange thing i've talked about this a little bit on other podcasts it's like i'm still working out how to articulate it because it's just one way that i say it is when when you're a kid born in a cult you don't know you're in a cult you think it's normal right yeah. and i really didn't put the pieces together until I was like 16, 17 years old of like, this is really wrong. This is really not normal. Part of the way that I did that was my mom was a little bit of a rebel within the community that she would allow me to do things outside of the cult. Um, they called it the church at the time. We didn't call it the cult, <laughs> called it the church. She let me do things outside of the, of the church. Uh, like I played baseball and then I, I started doing martial arts and I started meeting kids that were my age, you know, maybe a year older, or a year younger. And I would sort of talk to them and they'd be like, what school do you go to? And I'd, well, I don't really go to school. And I was homeschooled. Right. And, uh, and I started slowly as I was talking to the other kids, putting it together. Like there's a reason that the leader tried so hard to keep the kids from getting outside of the cult because as soon as you start talking to other kids, they they tell you like, dude, something's weird, something's up. So I, I'd sort of put it together to realize that what I was in wasn't normal. And I, I ran away from home at like 16 mm -hmm. years old. And the owner of the karate school that I was going to ended up becoming best friends with his son, who was like a year older than me. And I just went and lived at his house. And so when I started living, living there, I, I like at 16 years old, tried to get my shit together. So I was very neglected. 
academically. I took a uh, standardized test and realized I had a third grade spelling level. Hmm. It's funny, this all ties into sort of my, my brand and where I'm at now because I'm, I'm huge on writing. I Even before I was 16, I really, when I was like 11, 12 years old, fell in love with reading and writing. I could always read pretty good, but my writing was terrible. My grammar was terrible because I pretty much taught myself to, to, to write. You know, yeah. I didn't have any teachers. I didn't go to public school. And um, I, I remember believing when I was 15, like, I'm going to grow up and be an author. I love to write. I got a passion for it. And and I go back and look at what I used to write back then. And it was, you know, spelling was terrible. And the grammar was, you know, way the hell off. And I just, I didn't know. I was just oblivious, right? So I had this huge wake up call when I took that test of like, oh shit, you're not going to be a writer, dude. You're so behind the eight ball. Like you're going to have to work your ass off just to be able to pass the high school exit exam. So um, I ended up, I, I was working at the martial arts school that, uh, that the owner that I was, I was living with was letting me live at. And I was making a little bit of money and I started paying a tutor, a spelling tutor to teach me, you know, how to, how to spell. And I just went all in on that. And within the next two years, by the time I graduated high school, I was spelling at a 12th grade level. Um, mm. So I like made up that ground, you know, by like really yeah. hustling and, and putting in the work to, to get my grammar and spelling and all that up. And so, yeah, that's sort of a little bit of, the growing up in a cult, how I got out, and then a little bit of where it, you know, got me today and part of my writing journey. It, there's a, a lot more to that side of the writing journey that maybe we can get into, but I just teased that a little bit there. But uh, I've been talking for a while. I want to give you a chance to yeah, ask me some more questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so your grandpa was not part of the cult, right? No, he wasn't. Okay. Yeah. I. Uh, it's funny. It's funny how. Uh, Cult leaders are kind of all the same yeah. to a certain degree. You know, there's mm -hmm. charismatic people who usually know, like, they're informed. They're not dumb people, usually. They're people who are fairly above average intelligence. They're not geniuses, usually. But they know how to manipulate people. They're really good with uh, psychology. And they usually have familiarity with another religion that they can use to bring people in with. So like mm -hmm. the familiarity with Christian religion. You know, if you start... I, it, it, I, uh, I'm in Utah, and uh, who's the girl? Uh, Elizabeth Smart was... I don't know if you know her name, but she, she was uh, kidnapped by people... Oh, man, it might have been close to 20 years ago now, or mm -hmm. around 20 years. And... I've heard people say like she w it wouldn't have been as easy to take her because I think she was like fourteen maybe and but she was raised Mormon so she was raised around like those scriptures and stuff like that and the people who kidnapped her I think they kind of brainwashed her and they used that mm -hmm. against her like they used that to manipulate her into believing that she was supposed to be with them it was God's will i don't know all the details of the story so hopefully i'm not messing anything up but it's a common thing when it comes to cults and with uh with that like pe the leaders or the people who are manipulating use what the other people already knew and they yeah. manipulate that into convincing them that this is the right way you need to be in this cult and uh or this church so uh it, let's talk about your mother she like you left when you were 16. She was still a part of it. Uh, is she still? Um... No, she ended up um, leaving like within a year of when I left. That's another story um, uh, where I'm at with her. We're, we're good at this point. Yeah. Uh, but we had a, we had a couple year, you know, um, of being distant just because of working out everything from my childhood. And then I got married young and uh, she didn't, approve of my wife which in retrospect should have listened to her <laughs> it was not the best <laughs> the best thing but i had to had to do my had to go through my own journey and then when i was basically not before i had that that was many years i was i think maybe six years in i had sort of known that this is after my second daughter was born 
I'd sort of known that things were not going to work out with my wife. And, and I'd sort of talk with my wife about that of like, we need to start thinking about separating. I don't want to hit you or blindside you or whatever, but like, uh, you know, it, it was bad. Like one of us is going to end up dead. Like at a certain point, like, you know, somebody's going to kill somebody. We need to like cool, cool off. We got to get the feelings out of this. And I ended up like moving in. We had a little in-law unit in the backyard. I like started moving in there just to give a little bit of space, like did everything possible to try to stay together, you know, for the kids. But um, it just hit a point where we couldn't anymore. And I eventually had to move out and we divorced. So when I sort of got into that stage of, of knowing that things weren't going to work out with my wife, even before we weren't officially separated, I reached back out to my, to my mom and dad. And, and we've gone through a lot of good healing with everything. And my mom's <laughs> she's apologized to me a lot for the childhood, uh, you know, and everything. Uh, she, there was a point there was like, we would talk about once a month. I'd see her maybe two times a year. Um, she doesn't live here. She lives in Oregon. So it's, you know, normally a six hour drive or so to come down and see me. And every time I talked to her and every time she see me, she would cry and apologize for everything from my childhood. And, we sort of got past that. I, and I would always like, I don't hold any resentments. I just like, it's cool, yeah. mom. Like it, it turned me into the man that I am today. I like who I am today. You know, my life is good. It's cool. Like, you know, it, you can, you can let go of it, but she, she really um, just has a hard time. She dedicated 20 years of her life to this, to this yeah. community, to this cult. And she feels like they stole, you know, her best years basically. And, um, I'm her only child and she feels like she didn't really have a chance to raise me the way that she wanted, wanted to and all that. And, um, but she's in a good place now. She got remarried, well, not she never married my dad, but she got married to my stepdad when I was four years old. And I think they just celebrate, yeah, they just celebrated their 30th anniversary. They've been together ever since. And they're like, you know, just super tight. They spend every single day together for freaking 30 years, basically. And, and I have a real pretty good relationship with my stepdad too. He's really, he's who I call dad because my, my real dad took off and yeah, I don't know. We're, we're in a better place now and they eventually got out of that place, but it took them 20 years yeah. to separate and um, to, to separate from the cult and they made it out. Other people had more trouble getting out of like, like the, the leaders would be like really vindictive and and yeah. sl slander their reputation, you know, online and stuff like that, and all that, and and my my parents ma ma managed to break away pretty clean, which is cool. Uh, your biological father, are you in touch with him anymore? <laughs> he texted me the other day. <laughs> it's so funny, dude. So he's <laughs> this is. I often say that my my biological dad like is the weirdest person I've ever known in my life. Hmm. Like one way to explain it is he doesn't talk like a normal person. He cannot string a coherent sentence together. I almost want to read you this text that he sent me because he sent this text to me. And I have two, uh, two half brothers uh, that are older than me from a different mom. And I'm, I'm the, I'm the youngest, you know, with just my mom. And, um, he sent something the other day about a Akashic record reading thing that he got, which is cool. Like I'm sure you've heard of the Akashic records, right? Has it, um, no. Okay. Um, Akashic um, records. It's this idea that there's this library with all of, uh, all knowledge from, all, you know, the universe and that you can sort of tap into it. And there's this spiritual practice or community of people that say that they can go and read the Akashic records. They sent me something the other day about getting Akashic record reading. And, uh, I don't know, like, he, as a writer, like a huge part of my identity and art form is being able to s tell s stories clearly so that people can understand them or, or write a message really clear and like coherent in a way that I'm not wasting anybody's time. And like he talks and writes the exact opposite. It's all <laughs> like weird poetry, yeah. <laughs> esoteric words and shit like that. And, and uh, I remember like trying to warn people. Cause like when I first started dating my ex-wife, I, I remember like warning her before she, she met him of like, I don't really even know how to prepare you for this man, but he's just the weirdest guy you're ever going to meet. And we you know, went and got coffee and talked to him for an hour and, 
and he left. And I said, am I crazy or is he the weirdest guy? She's like, I've lived in San Francisco. I've met some fucking weirdos. That That is the weirdest dude I've ever met in my life. Yeah. It's like, he's just, I don't know how else to say it. So anyway, I do talk to him maybe like once a year. I'll call mm. him on his birthday or Father's Day. Um, and it's it's pretty sad, dude, because um, people throw around the word narcissist a lot. Um, but I think he's one of the best examples of a narcissist in my life. Because when I call him on the phone, he doesn't ask me how I'm doing. He doesn't care to know about his his granddaughters. He doesn't care to know what's going on in my world at all. He yeah. wants to talk about the latest stuff that he's been doing. And he'll go for three hours. And, you know, he's 70 years old. I mean, part of that is, you know, just people get old and they get lonely and they're excited. They got somebody's ear and they want to <laughs> talk their ear off about what they're, what's happening. But it, it's rough. And it's, it's, I'm lucky to be in a place where it's like, I'm not looking for anything from him. I'm not looking for approval. I'm not looking for fatherly, you know, advice. I'm not looking for acceptance. Like, it's just, okay, it's cool. I'm happy. I'm, I'm good with where I ended up. And it's, if anything, it's just the greatest cautionary tale of my life. <laughs> the greatest anti-hero of what I, I don't want to be as a father and as a man. It's funny because parents, fathers, mothers, they teach you usually a combination of the two, but they teach you on one extreme of the spectrum what you want to be like and on the other what you don't want to be like. like yeah. And uh, most, I think most parents, like most parents are neither extreme completely. Most parents are like, because <laughs> it's funny because we, when we're growing up, we look at our parents as like these wise people and like, mm-hmm. they, they know everything and then we start to become adults ourselves and are like yeah they were just trying to figure shit out too <laughs> you <laughs> exactly. know like they didn't, yeah. you know and but uh yeah this it's sad that you have had closer to the one extreme you know yeah so uh with uh with your marriage I'm, when you were talking about the cult I'm I'm just kind of curious if you feel like there's a connection to being in a cult until you were 16 and getting married at a young age. 100%. I wrote a post about this, actually. Yes, yes, yes. Um, when, I, when I was going through it really bad, when she was pregnant with my second daughter, um, I had done therapy off and on throughout my, my 20s, but I found a therapist that I really liked. That was an older man um, that was a father, and he was somewhat spiritual leaning. And... Um, I remember him saying, like, I'm t- talking about growing up in the cult, talking about where I was at with my wife at the time. And he goes, you left a cult and joined another cult. And it was, it's your marriage with her. Because she, I, a lot of the qualities of a cult, she isolated me from my family, from my friends, was very controlling over my time. Um, you know, everything. And, and I remember him saying that it was like a a total aha moment for me of like, oh shit, like I was primed for this by my childhood. And in the way that a lot of, you know, if you're abused when you're a kid, uh, if you don't do the work to sort of process that, then you look for that in your, in your next relationship as an adult, right. And in your significant other. I definitely was primed to step into a situation where it's like, I don't want to make any decisions because I've never made decisions in my life. I've always been told what to do. I've always been told what's right and wrong. I know how to please, you know, the people, the adults in my life and in and, and my community and stuff. And I stepped right into another, um, uh, another situation like that. I, I wrote a post on X the other day about growing up in a cult. I, you know, escaping and then within two years ending up in another cult. And, Mm. and then I did write, I did nuance it a little bit in there of like, I'm not saying that my wife is a cult, my ex wife is a cult leader. Like I'm just, I'm sort of framing it from, from my perspective that I was searching for that same dysfunction, that same, you know, environment that I was used to. Uh, So yeah, I think they're intimately tied. And I feel like when I did uh, separate from her, that I did finally sort of break out of that cycle, you know, that I had spent the first 30 of my years, 30 years of my life sort of in and, and finally taking responsibility for myself that uh, it's not anybody else's fault. Nobody else is going to tell me what to do. I have to decide what to do. 
Yeah. And and how I'm going to lead my life. And it's it's like the coolest, most freeing feeling ever. And it's also terrifying because yeah. it's like, oh, fuck. Like, you know, uh, what's the Spider-Man line? With great freedom comes great responsibility, right? Yeah. All that responsibility can be really, really heavy. But, uh, you know, some growing pains there. And, and now I feel like I'm in an amazing place where I'm, I'm enjoying the freedom and the ability to, to choose how I want to live my life, how I want to lead my days. And and feeling good about the taking responsibility for all that too, and and not feeling sort of like it's crushing or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned freedom, and freedom is a we take it for granted in the West. You know, we take the concept of freedom is like everybody loves freedom, and then we talk about freeing other countries. You know, like with our mm-hmm. military and stuff, and not everyone wants to be free. You know, yeah. I've I've talked to people about communism and there's people who are, just because somebody was in a bad situation, like communism or whatever it might be, doesn't mean that they appreciate the other side of the coin. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they appreciate freedom because with a lack of freedom comes a lack of responsibility. And yeah. people don't always realize that when you when you give somebody freedom, that also means you're giving them responsibility, which is really hard to deal with for people who haven't had that. Agreed. Yeah, no, 100%, man. I, again, that's been the biggest transformation. I, I didn't even know how unfree I was, how bound, it, how bound I was until I was given it. And then you know, thinking that what I always wanted was freedom and then feeling the responsibility thrown on top of that. But I, I do think ultimately for me, and I think really for everybody, but you have to like do the work to get to that point for yourself personally. I think the greatest expression for any of us is going to be accepting the most responsibility possible, right? And and the freedom that goes along with that. Yeah. Where are you at spiritually now? Like, are you, do you consider yourself a part of any religion? You have Buddha in your uh, podcast name. Um, Buddhism is complex. Like some people yeah. are, I consider myself influenced by Buddhism, but I'm not Buddhist per se. Um, so where are you? Yeah. Spiritually. Yeah. I always say I'm an inspiring Buddhist. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a Buddhist, uh, just sort of out of respect for people that are born into that culture and, and, yeah. you know, really put the time today. I think if you're a Westerner that wants to call yourself Buddhist, like you better have read all the books and gone to the retreats and, you know, maybe even visited India and like, you know, did some pilgrimages and stuff. Uh, I've read at least 50 plus books on Buddhism. A lot of stuff by Alan Watts, Sam Harris, Joseph Goldstein, um, because it's a bunch of other names. It's been a while. A bunch of other names come to mind that that aren't coming to mind. I've read stuff by the Dalai Lama. Um, and, uh, so Buddhist ideas are similar to Stoic ideas are some of that stuff that's just ingrained in me. You know, the, the parables, the stories, the, the philosophies are just really a huge part of my life. Um, I meditate. I've meditated really off and on since I was like a teenager, uh, really around the time that I ended up running away. Uh, I just, for some reason, had this intuition to, to meditate. And it's one of those things I always sort of played around with. I never really did it that consistently. I'd have good runs of a couple weeks in a row and I'd stop. Um, but I've meditated consistently for about f- over four years now. And do you know about Sam Harris? Yeah. The, the, yeah. Do you, do you know the waking up app, meditation app? Um, no, I, I know of it. I've never had it though. Yeah. Um, so I do that app and I, I'm a huge evangelical for Sam Harris and that waking up app. Him personally, I used to really like his stuff and listen to his podcast and all that. I really don't anymore, but that app is a really good, the greatest meditation instruction that I've come across. And I've tried a lot of the apps and, you know, done a lot of the free videos and all that. And what he, he teaches is basically mostly based around Dzogchen, which is Tibetan Buddhism. And, uh, I, I have found it as sort of the most refined of all the uh, Buddhist meditation practices. And so I've done that a lot. So that's a huge part. Of, and it's only 10 minutes a day every morning. But the consistency 
of doing it all the time um, does really ingrain itself into my my day to day, my moment to moment experience. And I find myself often meditating throughout the day without like really even thinking about it. Like I had a couple of moments today when I was at work, when I got off work and I was walking home where it just I was hearing the birds sing and yeah. I was watching the sunshine through the trees and it was just sort of like the thoughts stopped and I was empty for a moment and it's like a little enlightenment experience or whatever. And there was a time these really started happening for me around 28. So about six years ago, um, there was a time when one moment like that would blow my freaking mind and just be like, Oh my God, I'm present. Life is amazing. Life is magical. This feels like a scene in a movie. You know, what the hell's going on? They were so rare and few and far between. Um, and for a lot of reasons, but if I had to point to one, it's probably the regular meditation practice. They happen like every day. And it's yeah. it's a beautiful blessing, you know, that, that's been bestowed upon me that I can have those experiences regularly. And so that that's one way in. I could go down the non-duality route. I could go down the psychedelics route. I could talk about my spiritual teacher that came into my life six years ago. Um, but that was sort of just pinned in a little bit more on the Buddhist side of things uh, and, and meditation. Uh, so that to kind of answer your question. Yeah. What's that style of oh, that technique? Um, is it because I meditate on the breath? That's the it's funny because meditation to me was a very elusive concept, even though I, I grew up uh, Catholic and, you know, you're told to pray. And I feel like I learned how to pray from meditating. Like, I'm like, mm. oh, this is what prayer was supposed to be. Like, <laughs> just that's why, because in like Catholics, like after you confess to a priest, which is a really weird concept anyway, uh, they tell you to do like Our Fathers and Hail Marys and all this. So as a kid, you're like, okay, I go there and I just sang the prayers. But like, Looking back, I'm like, oh, you were supposed to meditate on the prayer. Like nice. that's what you were supposed to be doing. But they don't teach the concept of meditation. They teach prayer. And I feel like if I were to I'm not gonna teach somebody to be a Catholic, but that's how I would teach prayer is like you meditate, you're meditating, you're thinking, you're just completely focused on the words and the meaning and just nothing else that's the only thing that exists is the prayer in your mind um so is it similar to that because you're yeah, talking about focusing cool, on birds and stuff yeah like that, yeah right? we can get we can get so we're getting deep into meditation here there's something i write about a lot especially early on in my my newsletter um so my favorite definition of meditation to is to become familiar with hmm. so to meditate on something is to become more familiar with it and the act of meditation to me, to a lot of teachers, is becoming more familiar with the mind, right? Now, when we say the mind, most people think of a brain, a physical object that has neurochemical stuff flowing through it, right? But when, when I say mind, when a lot of spiritual teachers say mind, we're talking about reality. The fact of awareness itself is mind. The fact that I'm able to see you right now, all the five senses, I'm hearing, I'm smelling, I'm tasting, I'm, I'm touching, all of that is existing within mind in this concept of Dzogchen, of, of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. So when we're meditating, we're becoming more familiar with reality itself, hmm. with consciousness itself, because our sort of default mode network or our monkey mind, as they called it in, in older texts, is just sort of running all the time. It's just always, you know, one thing to the next and the next to the next, and it's all over the place. And if you can slow down, then you can sort of see this, this distracted, you know, tendency that the mind tends to go on. You can let it sort of calm down and, you know, the, all the analogies you can use, the water sort of the ripple stop and it smooths out and it gets a little bit clear. And now you're becoming more familiar with what's happening mm -hmm. here in this moment. And so that form of meditation is you're becoming more familiar with mind, with reality, with consciousness as it is here and now. 
And so that that's one take. One take is that meditation is becoming more, seeing more clearly reality as it is here and now. There are other definitions. Um, you, I think what you were talking about sounds a little bit like Vipassana, which is having an object to meditate on. And that's sort of when most people in the West say they have a meditation practice, they probably mean Vipassana because it's, it's really training your brain to be able to focus on one thing. So the most basic example is normally the breath because it's sort of the easiest and most accessible. accessible is you notice your mind again, racing all over the place, you know, thinking about the past, future, daydreaming. And you start to build the muscle of being able to only have it focus on your breath. All the way out, all the way to the end, all the way in again to the top and all the way out. And as your mind inevitably starts to go away from the breath and you know unconsciously start thinking about other stuff, you catch it and you bring it back to the breath. So your attention is focused on one object, your one object of meditation. In that case, it's your breath. You can start focusing on other things, um, you know, sensations, hearing, uh, even sights. You can have open-eyed meditations. Uh, and then one of the cooler things in Vipassana is when you learn to take thoughts as an object of meditation. So the, this is like a really cool little thing that I've learned to do in time uh, through like teachers showing me how to do this is the same attention and sort of detachment you can have from your breath like i am the awareness that is aware of this breath that's what my my attention and focus is on the thoughts are kind of like a problem i need to cut off the thoughts and bring them back to the meditation you can get to the point where you have that same attention for the breath for the thoughts and in the same way that the breath feels like this sort of detached thing that okay i'm breathing and i'm focused on the fact that i'm breathing but 99% of the time, I'm not thinking about that I'm breathing. I'm just breathing, right? It's, it's, it's automatic. You can start doing that with your thoughts of watching thoughts as they appear. And this might sound like a little uh, like stoner thought kind of thing, but it's, it's totally true. It's totally here and accessible, sober in this moment. You can see that thoughts come from nowhere. Where the hell do they come from? Normally, by the time you're thinking something, you missed its appearance. It's just already there. It's just already running, you know, off on, on whatever, whatever you're thinking about. But you can sort of see a thought comes from nowhere and then it disappears back into nowhere. And then you start to get a little bit more intimate, a little bit more familiar or meditation being, being familiar with the mind. You get a little bit more familiar with those spaces in between thoughts that emptiness, that, that, that zero place, right? And it doesn't mean that you stay there forever. I don't think anybody can. You know, there's arguments about people that reach enlightenment and they're able to stay there forever. I think thoughts are just part of having blood pumping to the brain. You're going to, thoughts are inevitable outcome. But if you meditate on those thoughts, you can get to the, set, be able to have that separation from the thoughts, watch them appear you know, see them as totally not something you're identified with. They're just the, this, you know, all the analogies again, there's clouds passing in the sky and then watching them go, you can connect to that place in between the thoughts more, that emptiness and have some really cool, crazy experiences. And that's another way to get to the hearing the birds singing, watching the sun shine to the trees, sort of that empty place of just being in the flow of reality here and now. And the equation of like us, our egoic thinking mind that needs to, you know, understand everything or, or know where everything's going or, you know, make a plan for the best outcome possible, just sort of all being aside for a second. And that's, again, a kind of a, a very spiritual thing. Jesus talking about us becoming like young children and all that. Like you're just here. You're just alive here in this moment. You're enjoying stuff. And, for me, like I'm not there forever. I'm still a father. I still got to, you know, make plans and make decisions. I have a day job. I got to do stuff. I have creative stuff that I want to do. But I think any sort of spiritual practice that can tap me into those little moments, those little moments in between the thoughts, those little moments of appreciating the birds chirping, 
uh, like a couple times a day, I think I'm killing it. Like yeah. I'm going to stick with that program. <laughs> I'm going to be doing those spiritual practices as much as I can. I felt like I went on forever, bro. So thank yeah, you for having patience. That's actually one of the best explanations for meditation I've ever heard. Um, wow, thank so you, bro. Because um, I've been meditating. I, I've been really bad at daily practice lately. But uh, for the last few years, I've been fairly consistent. I do seven minutes every morning. Um, and I just do medita- meditation on the breath. But now I want to try to focus on thoughts because uh, I, I, I mean i know the concept like what's the sound of one hand clapping like mm-hmm. i know of the idea but it's always that's been elusive to me so you actually explained it in a very useful way right on i read a book called the Depe- tibetan book of living and dying and it it changed my view on death quite a bit and uh, you and I have touched on death and uh, spaces a little bit. And I know you talk about death. And you do a deathbed meditation. Um, yeah. Can you tell a little bit about what that's about? Yeah. So um, I think about death often. Um, and I think I just sort of have always been this way. I think it started hitting harder after my first daughter was born. Um, like it does for a lot of people. So I think I sort of already had a natural proclivity to like, we're all going to die. I'm going to die. Like just, just, it was in my face. I couldn't really hide from it. Like most people, it seems like from afar are able to. And I say that because I do talk about it so much. So I get to see a lot of examples of how people react. And a lot of people don't like talking about it. <laughs> they don't like hearing me talking about the fact that, you know, I'm going to die. You're going to die. But I do, I'm lucky enough because I do share it so much. I've found some, some weirdos like myself that enjoy it, you know, such as yourself. <laughs> I think it's a really important thing to meditate on and talk about. Um, so yeah, after, after my daughter was born and then I think around 30, it just hit this whole new level. Um, and again, psychedelics being a big part of my life. Um, I do mushrooms often and on mushroom trips, again, this is, pretty universal but it seems to hit hit even harder for me mortality is always a huge topic mm. that's just very much in my face when i'm on mushrooms it's like undeniable like dude you don't think about the fact that you are going to pass away you don't know when that's going to come it could be tomorrow it could be 60 years from now 70 years from now but like you need to be ready for that moment because if you're not, like, it's going to be really rough. It's going to be like the worst trip ever, right? And there's a lot of stuff in, in Buddhism that talks about um, all spiritual practices, preparation for a good death. This is something I, I talk with Duncan, Duncan Trussell about on my podcast. You know, some people will object to that of like, why are you going to live your whole life just to have a good moment of death, right? You should just enjoy your life and um, you know, just deal with however the death comes when it does. But I think it's a great North Star and roadmap if you go, okay, how do I want to feel in my final moment when I when I'm going? Because it you're hopefully not gonna die today. There's a very small percentage chance you are, or tomorrow or next week. So if you consider how you can hedge your bets against the least regret possible how you can feel the best about the life that you're looking back on, right? At whatever point it comes that you look back over your life and you go, you know, I did my best. I'm proud of the life that I live. I'm leaving something behind that I feel good about. I lived a meaningful life. I showed up for my relationships the best that I could. I'm okay. I'm able to go in some sort of peace. If you have that as sort of a direction, then day in and day out, I I don't see any other way that you're going to, make more meaningful decisions, more purposeful, you know, on the direction of your highest purpose possible than if you run it through that filter, right? Of the the fact that you are you are gonna die. You don't know when it's gonna come. And um you're then blessed with today, which is a day that you're alive, a day that you do have a chance to have a better answer when you meet your final moment, right? And it helps to just prioritize so much stuff, right? You know, it, it helps to make you stop worrying about the little shit 
and maybe start to worry a little bit more about the really most important stuff and making sure that you get the time and attention to the most important things possible and you sort of forget about the other stuff. Because, you know, think about it like if, if I were to lay down tonight and pass away, would I really be worried about that stupid deadline or, you know, that petty argument or this or that? No, I'd be worried about the really important stuff. My family, my loved ones, you know, my, my, the really important, passionate work, the enjoying, you know, the day to day, moment to moment stuff that I want to do. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't know if that answers your question, but like yeah. I, I've thought about this stuff a lot. And also like, I, I don't, I, I think it's a net benefit for me. I think it's a net positive thing to meditate on these, the, these, because again, people will say one of my favorite lines, I think this is original Nick Bebo. Um, people will say thinking about death is morbid. And I'll always say, I think it's the most life affirming thing you can do. It's the opposite of being morbid. When you th- think about the fact that you're going to die, when you accept the fact that you're going to die, it affirms that you're not dead. You're alive. You have a chance to like live a better life here and now. And, you know, it doesn't like nobody's going to fucking live forever. That's a fantasy or some sort of a, a, you know, unconscious thing that you just aren't addressing. So the fact that you face it, it is going to come in few in, empowers you with this like i'm alive man i want to live the best day possible here today i want to do the most with the time that i still have here you know yeah. with with psychedelics because i've i can get into some seemingly dark thoughts when i'm on psychedelics but it's not supposed to be dark it's just exploring reality like one thing is like there are people dying right now like there are people literally dying right mm-hmm. now and wars going on and i'll think about some stuff like that and you know why hate exists i will think some negative it's not negative in the sense where i'm like dwelling on it and i'm feeling hate it's just feeling a little bit sad that these things exist and i will think about death and stuff like that do you have you done psychedelics with people who you have to worry about bringing them down a little bit cuz i've had that yeah um i've done psychedelics with my girlfriend that was that was the last one that was a very positive experience um my really good friend and we already talk about this stuff all the time my yeah. my spiritual brother we talk about death all the time and on mushrooms it's just or lsd it's just like turn up the volume like i've never i guess to answer your question i've never been with anyone when they're having a bad trip luckily yeah, yeah. I've had people kind of going in the direction of a bad trip and then I just, you know, be the best trip sitter that I can, the best shaman that I can and sort of turn it around (laughs) for them and, you know, don't focus on the negative anymore. Um, Yeah, for me, I've never had a bad trip, knock on wood. That doesn't mean that I haven't faced really heavy stuff. Again, I face the fact that I'm going to die. I've, I've, I've contemplated the death of my children, you know, when I've been on mushrooms, I've contemplated war and, and, you know, just human suffering and torture and all the worst shit that, you know, human beings can experience. But I I don't call them bad trips because I'm just sort of like detached enough from them. And I just see it as like, I always, I always think of the mushrooms as, as almost being like a separate entity that's trying to show me something, you know? And I just go like, okay, oh, this is what the mushrooms are showing me today. Like, yeah. I get it. <laughs> Human existence is rough. The Buddha yeah. was right. Life is suffering. <laughs> like, this, is, well, this shit is right. I get the message and it makes me appreciative of the fact that I'm not in a war torn country, uh, you know, that I'm healthy, that I'm not dying of a disease, that everyone in my life, you know, the, my, my children are healthy and all that. And um, yeah, I, but that's a it's a scary thing to play with. I get it, yeah. and that's why I never really recommend anybody does psychedelics. I always do all the, um, all the warnings and you know disclaimers ahead of time because I'm like, if if you're not ready for this and you're you're, you're just opening yourself up, you know, <laughs> you're rolling the dice for all sorts of crazy experiences. And I don't want you to blame me or say because you heard that I had a good experience yeah. that you thought you were going to have the same, like it's very dangerous um, 
dicey stuff to deal with. It, it's again, my friend and I always say like, you're just psychologically naked when, when you eat these mushrooms, like you're just open and vulnerable to the world. And yeah. maybe, maybe they'll treat you great and they'll give you a, a great you know, lesson that you can walk out the other side with, or maybe they'll just tear you up, you know, and if (laughs) they tear you up, like that was what you needed, I guess, at that time. I've been torn up a little bit a few times, uh, especially with mushrooms, but um, I always come out the other side feeling better and feeling really like I know what I need to do now. Yeah. And I always, when I have an important decision to make in life, I always joke, I need to go talk to the mushrooms about it. And they're undefeated. They always... (laughs) tell me to make the right call. I follow through with it and yeah, they're undefeated. So. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause my, my friend and I, we've done psychedelics a bit together and he's married. So his wife, uh, did them with us and it was actually pretty cool. Cause she, she admitted to me, she was like, I was a little bit worried about doing psychedelics with you. Cause you, you can talk about some deep, heavy stuff. Yeah. And I did, I talked about some, fairly heavy stuff at one point, but she had an appreciation for it. So I feel like the mushrooms helped her see where I was coming from. Like I wasn't coming from a, Hey, let's dwell on this stuff. It's like, Hey, there's this stuff going on. And it's actually pretty beautiful that we are not dealing with that right now. And, and it'd be cool if we can, more people can get on the wavelength that want to make the world better, you know? Totally. So yeah. Uh, you know, something that's really, you said the mushrooms are going to show us something. And I actually wasn't on mushrooms at this time. Uh, I was on LSD once, but I had a friend who was growing mushrooms and he said, I want to show you something. And he brought me into a room and he, into his closet where he was growing and there was a UV lamp going on the mushrooms. I saw the mushrooms like feeding, like you can't convince me that I didn't actually see <laughs> what they were doing. Like you were, you were on LSD looking at the mushrooms? I was on LSD and I was looking at mushrooms You're growing. It's psychedelics, man. That's yeah, cool. And and it was like it was the most amazing. It, I it's right up there with the northern lights for me for like the coolest as a natural phenomenon that I've ever seen. It was like you can see the mushrooms like this network of stuff right below the surface Mm -hmm. just moving food to the top of the mushroom that's cool and i was like i looked at my friend i'm like are you seeing the same thing like can i explain it and he's like 100 percent. and i was like this is insane (laughs) like this is the (laughs) coolest thing ever and i'm like i want to experience that again so bad I did. I'm, you're convincing me. I'm going to set that up. I'm going to get the LSD. I'm going to get the mushrooms with the UV lamps. I want to well, see. I'm it convinced too. that you can see it on mushrooms. I'm convinced yeah, yeah, that yeah. it doesn't have to be LSD. Uh-huh. I believe that it because the two are very similar. They have mm-hmm. some overlap, and uh, yeah, I mean, both of them can show you some stuff. I feel like mushrooms are actually more intense for me. Um, me too. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I always, I always think of mushrooms like they feel so primal. They feel yeah. very earthy, right? Like, and that's why I like to do it in nature um, at a low enough dose. If I'm going to, I've done a, the crazy heroic doses a few times and it's just not safe to be outside for that. So I you know, do it in bed with my, with my blindfold on. But a uh, majority of the time, I, I like being in nature and doing mushrooms because it just, it just, it's so human. It's like so animal and primal and, and you just really are able to reconnect with the earth. Um, yeah. LSD to me is a lot more uh, heady, you know, up, up, up in the brain for sure. And it, I don't know what for you, but it's like um, can kind of feel computer simulating, simulating yeah. sometimes too. Like it's, you know, really connecting almost to a different dimension. Whereas mushrooms is just like deeper diving into this dimension of organic, you know, yeah. human animal life. Yeah. You uh you were mugged one time and that ties into the death meditation. Um yeah. because you had thought about this and can you go into that story a little bit so listeners can hear what happened and and how the death meditation and preparation for that potential death that you you didn't luckily experience but that it was pretty close it, like it could have turned into that had things gone a little differently. 
Totally, man. This is uh, one of the craziest experiences of my life, but it's become a story that I really love to tell. It's my pin post on my profile on X. I'm really proud of that post. I've, I have a lot of people tell me that they read it and they've teared up, they've cried, they've changed their life, they've started a daily writing habit off of it. Um, and so, yeah, it was a good setup because we got into sort of my philosophy around thinking about death, meditating on it. Something I didn't quite mention was I literally do a practice every day like I could do it right now with you. It's intense for a lot of people, but where I go, I'm going to die in 10 seconds. It's over. How do I feel? And the first time you do it, for a lot of people, it's like fucking terrifying. It's like, nope, nope, not looking. You know, <laughs> I'm going to put the blinders on. I don't want to deal with that. So it's sort of, you got um, to ease your way into it. Uh, but I've got to the point where I've, I've done it so much where it's talk about something that'll make you present really quick. Like, oh, I'm gone in 10 seconds. There's no more time to plan <laughs> for anything. Like, it's over. <laughs> it's over here and now. Yeah, how do I feel? And then and trying to feel some sort of like connection to what that finitude for this human body is going to be. And I, I have a a strong hunch. I'm I'm putting my money on be the bet that when the body goes, I think there is some sort of consciousness that lives on. Um, I, I I think ultimately that Nick and and this little individual consciousness doesn't really even exist. It's just sort of an expression of the one consciousness itself, just going through this unique little container. I think when this container ends, that'll you know remerge with the one consciousness and I, I'm not too worried of having to experience my own non-existence basically. Um, I think it's like uh, I'm fortunate enough to have this life and be alive here and now. And when it's over, th there won't be any death to endure. Um, if that makes any sense. So yeah, I had done that practice many years for a long time. I've done it on mushrooms, which is like, you know, doing the uh, deathbed meditation on on steroids. And I had done it on mushrooms when I was uh, 31 years old. It was the week of my 31st birthday. And I had this message of, when you die, what are you going to regret the most? What are you going to wish that you have had done? And you're going to feel regret about the fact that you had not done it. You had 31 years and you never did it. And it was loud and clear, this message of, you need to write a book. You need to have writings down that you can hand to your daughters. Um, and I have always had this connection with Bruce Lee, who passed away at 31. Interesting connection there. I was 31 when I finally had come to this realization and did something about it. He passed away when he was 31 and his youngest daughter, Sharon Lee, was five years old. And so she didn't really have any physical memories of him. Uh, she kind of, I've heard her talk a few times. She remembers like seeing him on a Hollywood set once and seeing him at like a family dinner once. And that's kind of it. You, know, you don't have very many memories when you're that young. But she came upon his writings as she got older, like 12, 13 years old both public writings that were published for the world and then private writings, journals, and started living her life and feeling like she had a connection to her father through his writings. Started kind of like fatherly advice, basically, from beyond the grave. I remember hearing that when my wife was pregnant with my first daughter when I was 24 and just going like, oh shit, you need to write. Like it really hit me really hard of like, you need to write to have something to leave behind for your daughters in case you died prematurely. It's going to give you peace in that final moment to know you have that, that you're leaving that behind. For a lot of people, it's like a home. Okay. I know that my kids have a home or money or whatever. I don't know what it is, something about the way that I'm made up. It's, it's absolutely clear to me that the best thing I can leave behind is the written word for my daughters. And so I had had that message again when I was 24 
And I still like managed to avoid it. I remember like making New Year's resolutions every year and the top of every New Year's resolution was start a daily writing practice or write that book or write the first chapter of the book. And I just couldn't do it. And this ties into my uh, childhood of not getting educated properly. I had a lot of resistance, you know, had tr- trouble still with grammar and spelling and all that. And um, it was just a big hurdle to to pass over. And so I, I procrastinated. I, I put it off for many years. Fast forward to being 31 years old on mushrooms, thinking about, you know, uh, Sharon Lee had just um, published her book, Be Water, My Friend, which was accounts of the writings of her of her father and uh, how reading his writings had changed her life. And basically she felt like she had her father from beyond the grave. And I'm sitting there on mushrooms just going like, dude, you have to do this. Because if you don't, if you die young, this is going to be screaming in your face. I told you, you needed to write something and you didn't do it. And now you get to go into the afterlife knowing that you failed this this message that I'm sending you. And so I finished that and then I... I finally got my act together and started writing. And I decided I'm going to write every single day. Um, I had a calendar, old school calendar. It's a Seinfeld method. Put an X every day that you write, right? And don't break the chain. And I had a little Sharpie pen and a calendar. I was living by myself this time. I'd gone through the divorce. And um, I got a few friends uh, from work or my personal life. And I was like, hey, I want to start sending a newsletter out every single week. But I like don't even know, you know, what person to go through or, or you know, a program to go through. I don't want to spend any money. Just give me your email. I'm just going to send you the email. Like super old school. Like, you know, Amazon starting in the in the basement. I I like just got people's email and I sent it for my personal email. I think there was like eight people at first, and I started writing these letters a lot about meditation, stoicism, Buddhist ideas with the idea of it being for my daughters. Hmm. And I would sometimes even write directly to them. Um, just stories that I would tell, whatever. And I'd send them out to my friends, just sort of to keep me accountable. And then it slowly grew with time. It was, it was slow and steady. I was writing three to 500 words a day. Uh, I work a lot. I'm very busy. And I started waking up at 5 a.m., to write for an hour before I went to work every single day. And that was basically my sacred writing hour. And then I hit the point of doing it for like six months and it just sort of just, you know, took on a life of its own. I went and found Substack. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And started, you know, being a little more formal. I created a website, um, nickbebo.com, started posting everything on there and uh, just sort of grew with time. And I had this crazy experience. This is a whole nother story of meeting my hero, Duncan Trussell. This is, so I'd started really that daily writing practice in January of 2022. And in September 25th of that same year, I, so I had written basically every day for almost 10 months straight. I had published something every week for, you know, however many weeks that is, good amount. And I had this crazy night. I met this comedian that I love, Duncan Trussell. And I was at a comedy show. It got done late. I got home at about two in the morning. I live in uh, Oakland, California, which is a metropolitan city with a lot of crime. Um, maybe some of the most in the country. And I had never gotten home that late. And when I, where I lived at the time, I had to park in sort of a parking garage and walk about three blocks to get to my front door. And I was home late. Uh, it was about two in the morning. I was walking to my front door and I was half a block away when I saw three men come from around the corner. And I knew right away that they were out They were, they were out for me. And there was kind of nowhere to go. I couldn't turn around and run. I couldn't get to my front door because they were tw- between me and my front door. I didn't have any, you know, weapons on me or anything like that. Like I knew it was it was going to be bad. So, one guy came up to me. He had like a kind of a trench coat on, a big coat. Reached into his jacket, pulled out a pistol and stuck it in my face. He said, "Give me all your shit." And 
I remember being terrified, you know, right away. Holy shit. Okay. I don't want to die. Uh, I put my hands up and I reached down into my pocket. I had a phone, a wallet and keys. And one of the other guys had come from around the back. There was cars next to us. He, I didn't even see him. I was obviously focused on the guy with the gun. And as my hands were in my pocket, he reached around and grabbed my arms and picked me up. So I'm, I'm a little guy. I'm five, seven. And both these guys were over six foot, all three of them. Um, and he picked me up. And the guy with the gun reached in my pocket and grabbed my my phone, grabbed my wallet, and grabbed my keys. And when he saw the keys, I have a Honda, I have a Honda Civic. This is parked again three blocks away, locked away in a parking garage. He saw the keys. He goes, where the fuck are you, is your car? And he hits me with the gun, pistol whips me, right? Glasses go fl- flying off. I'm seeing stars. Um, it was It was rough. It was a hard hit. And I, you know, realized right away, like, oh, okay, this isn't just like a, a robbery. Like these guys are willing to strike me. Um, and that was when it started kind of creeping into my mind of this, this could be it. Like, it, yeah. I remember feeling like uh, this is the test. Like, you know, all, the, everything else was practice. You think about the fact that you could die all the time and, you imagine that you want to try to stay calm and equanimous and all that. And here it is, dude, like you're, you might die. Um, so I got hit and I remember kind of trying to stay calm and, and I was explaining to him, my car is th- three blocks from here. Are you, you going to carry me three blocks? I remember asking, which he, I don't know, he took it as sarcasm and he hit me again, pistol hit me again. Um, I remember like literally feeling the blood coming down my face like I remember being like fuck like I hope I hope my teeth aren't chipped I hope like I hope I make it through this for one but it was like it was it was bad it was it was hurt I was hurting um and he after he hit me the second or third time he pointed the gun again right in my face and he was saying I'll fucking shoot you I'll fucking shoot you and I in that moment all the practice I had done of the you're going to die in 10 seconds. How do you feel about it? It was like, you're going to die in 10 seconds, dude. <laughs> this guy might, the guy holding you might drop you on the ground. You're going to hear a, a gun shot go off and then that's it. And it's, it's over. This life's done. I remember feeling so sad about the fact that my daughters were going to grow up without a dad. That was the front of my mind. And I remember feeling like it's such a shame. Like, for what? For a phone, wallet, and a car. These poor little angels that are everything to me are going to grow up without a dad. And really feeling how, like, what a shame that was. And me feeling bad that I was dumb enough to be out there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And that it was going to end like this. And I remember feeling that really strong. And also what like penetrated through that sadness was, but you did do it, dude. You wrote, you said that you wanted to write something and leave it behind. And this might be it. And you're leaving those writings behind for them. And that's, again, in my pin post, that's, that's what I write about is I got the message of like, hey, you want to die with the least regret possible? This is what you have to do. And I actually did it. And I actually faced in that moment that I thought was my last moment. And I actually didn't feel that much regret because <laughs> I had done the little piece that I thought that I could do. And, and you know, still to this day, I I... I own that i i had this near-death experience and i have this real example that nobody can take from me that yes it does work it did work for me um so anyway they uh they he struck struck me a couple of times and they were getting frustrated and luckily a cop car came by i remember seeing the lights of the cop car hearing the third guy who was kind of on watch wasn't involved as much hands-on say, oh shit, the cops. And the guy that was holding me threw me 
against a chain link fence, a little unnecessary. My shoe fell off when I hit the ground. And then he picked up the shoe and threw it over the fence too, <laughs> which was like really a, they're running from the cops and he still managed to pick up my shoe and throw it over. I got the shoe the next day. It had blood stains on it. I washed the blood stains out and I actually still have them. Um, and uh, they ran off and then I, I ran after a cop car with the one shoe that I had and uh, tracked it down and, you know, I I didn't have keys to get into my apartment. I didn't have a phone to call anybody. Uh, but I, I got a hold of the cops and, and they checked me out. They looked to see if I, you know, had any brain damage or a broken nose or anything like that. I went to the hospital and then they ended up bringing me to a friend's house and I slept mm-hmm. at the friend's house that night. And next day, I started both getting my life together and I started writing an article about this exact story the next day. It's an intense story. It, the The duality of it is pretty interesting too. The fact that you you're probably on a high from meeting yes. this idol of yours, like this person that you admire, and then having such a horrible low moment later in that night. That you know, wow, it's intense. Yeah, it was it's craziest night ever. It really, was the highest high imaginable to the lowest low. Um, and the fact that they both happen in the same night is one of those things. I, I think you may have heard me say this before on spaces. I often feel like my life is a simulation um, just because it's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> just because these really insane things happen. The people I meet are so crazy and they have the craziest stories. And it, it's reached a point where like kind of nothing can surprise me anymore. Like the yeah. weirder and crazier and more outlandish something is that happens, the more I'm just kind of like, oh, that's, that's just my life, dude. Like it's just the simulator is trying to tell me that it's all a simulation and, yeah. you know, make it as clear as possible. Yeah. When you talk about death too, I, I've, I mean, we were talking about thinking of yourself dying, but there's also the fact that other people will die, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I told you my dog died. Uh, in a yeah. space recently and it's interesting because I, I look at it and there was no preparation there's no preparing for it completely but I knew he was going to die one day that one day that I was most likely still going to be living um, and I would have these moments with him when I would just I'd see him and I'm like this is temporary and I'd, I'd make sure I took the time to spend with him I, I would have mornings where I would think of him like I, he he was so cuddly, and I'd cuddle with him, and I'd be like, "This is, I need to soak in these moments." And he died early. He died at seven. I expected him to live until he was fifteen to twenty, and um, it it meant it mattered to me that I was aware that he was going to die because it, yeah. it helped me like really take in those moments, and I'm. I try to be that way. People don't like to think about death, like you said. And after Bandit died, people are weird. They don't want to talk about it. They want you to just feel better. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, I've I've lost something that meant the world to me. And it's not just going to go away. And when people's parents die, it's the same thing. It's like, no, it's intense. It's, it's horrible. And I actually... Uh, and where did I, somebody, I saw a post on X where somebody said, when you lose uh, a parent, you lose your past. Mm. When you lose, lose a, a child, you lose your future. Mm. And uh, I interviewed Ellen Greenberg's parents and or her father. And that's what I felt the whole time I was talking to him. I was like, you lost your future. And this, like, you have a kid to have a future with that kid, like, yeah. And it's it's just so much, um, but it's interesting how much death changes things too. Like, bandit dying is the reason I'm doing this podcast right now. Mm-hmm. So, because I had been sitting on the idea for years, and I'm like, he died, and then I'm like, I'm also 38, which is half the age of the average male life expectancy. Yeah. And I get in my head about what everyone else thinks. And I'm like, there's no reason to do this anymore. There's no reason to worry about what friends who 
if their affection for me isn't strong enough to withstand hearing my views that might differ from theirs and yeah. might if they're offended by that, there's no reason why I should care about that anymore. And I had a few conversations with people after Bandit died when I was still working at another job and I'm like, this is what I want to do. I want to talk to people. I want to hear people's stories because I find people's stories so interesting. I find your story insanely interesting. I, I love hearing about it. I love, I truly believe that the more perspective and understanding we have, the better world we can create. Agreed. So, yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. for you, man. I just want to say good, good for you, dude, for, for going for this. I love to hear, um, you know, death is, uh, inevitable part of life. And it can tear some people down or people can use it as inspiration. Yeah. Do you know, uh, Sarah, Sarah Larson? She's sometimes joined some of my spaces. She's one of my favorite X grader at Fearless Rising. Hmm. I, I'll send you some of her stuff. She's one of my favorite writers. She's one of my favorite people in general. She was on my podcast. She lost her dad sort of unexpectedly about yeah. five years ago. And it was the biggest tragedy of her life. Um, she was very close to her dad and she felt some regret. Like she had not, you know, been the best daughter possible, uh, you know, or, or the best person before that, before his passing. And then after he passed, it sort of birthed this whole new transformation, this whole brand, her writing, everything that she is is fearless rising, which is a really beautiful message. And she, you know, she writes amazingly. Um, and she talks about like, obviously if she could have her dad back, she, she wouldn't give anything. She would give anything up for that, but she can't. And the, f what she can do instead is try to build something meaningful out of the pain, out of the lessons that she, that she gained from that. And that is just something that I love. And I just wanted to commend you on like, you, it really hit me when you said, your dog passing is the reason you're doing this podcast. Like I feel that I know that feeling of like, you know, Hey, life is temporary. You know, am I going to allow other people's opinion uh, to keep me from living the best life that I can creating the work that I really want to create doing what I really love. And like you said, you love having good conversations and hearing people's stories, yeah. you know, and, and, and just good for you for going for that, man. I love to hear that. Well, I'm I'm an eccentric person. I've always been eccentric, a little felt like an outsider, even though I've had a lot of friends in my life. And it's, you know, you, I'm 38. I, I have felt boxed in and you feel life just kind of compress you down and, and you stop being not necessarily who you are, but you stop letting yourself show. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm tired of that. And I'm still growing. I'm still trying to figure out how to like express myself fully and, and let everything come out and figuring out who I am in general. And I'm insanely curious. That's, I've always been curious and I've always been very high in openness. Um, so I love, love exploring ideas with people and I'm open to being wrong. And I'll touch on controversial topics like politics. And I like talking politics with some people and with people in general and I've lost friends over politics and I've learned from that too. Like I, I try to respect people's opinions even when they're different than mine. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's my journey. I'm trying to figure it out, you know? So yeah, yeah I, I really, love it, man. It's like, uh, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you got to crack a few eggs. Like it, it does suck to lose relationships or friendships over something like politics or controversial stuff. But I think the, the other route is worse of not exploring yeah. and not going for it and speaking your mind and, and learning from, you know, other people along the way. I, I think it's, that's a worse sacrifice. I think being yourself, being eccentric, being true to yourself is the best route possible. And, and hopefully the real good close people in your life will understand and and yeah. you know, accept you for who you are yeah and people have i mean it's my friends my true friends are very supportive so that's awesome uh, yeah. i love i love it and your deathbed meditation is so important because the reality is what's the typical like hollywood scene is somebody's about to die and they're on their deathbed and they want a priest or somebody to like talk about all the things that they did wrong 
they want to like get a bunch of stuff off their chest and it's like why wait why wait yes. until that moment so nick i've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation i Me don't too, keep man you, i don't want to keep you on uh too much longer because then i got busy life so yeah um one thing I'd love to ask people is uh, about their favorite books, because I'm a huge reader. I would imagine a lot of people that listen like to read. So what are some of the most influential books you've found in your life? Yeah, also, I just did a post about this the other day. So these are sort of the books that have been like the Bibles of my brand on X right already in the Laughing Stoke Buddha. Um, War of Art by Stephen Pressfield is something I've read many times over. Um, I reread it every first of the year for like the last five years. Uh, very influential book. Atomic Habits by James Clear was sort of the practical guide for how I started. I was, you know, inspired by all this other stuff, but the practical guide of how I started a writing habit and writing every single day. I've read that book many times over, recommend it to everybody. I just bought it for my girlfriend the other day when we went to a bookstore for a date. So she's reading Atomic Habits right now. Um, yeah, War of Art, Atomic Habits. Obviously, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius is a no-brainer. Uh, Letters to a Stoic by Seneca, uh, Enchiridion, or there's there's two names for that book. The other one's something more practical, like The Art of Living. So Enchiridion or The Art of Living, which is basically the same books, different translations of uh, uh, Epictetus, Epictetus' work. Um, God, Be Here Now by Ram Dass, The Hippie Bible. That's a I've heard it called the hippie Bible. Be here now. A super influential book for me. Anything by Alan Watts. Um, uh, the book is probably my favorite. The book on the taboo of being yourself by Alan Watts. I'm looking over at my, my bookshelf here. Everything by Ryan Holiday. Courage is calling. Obstacles the way. Stillness is key. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, sorry, I'm just going on a roll here. <laughs> um, those are probably ma- most, I'm looking, at, oh, I Am That by Nisarkadatta Maharaj. That's another uh, purely like spiritual book if you want to just tap into like the essence of reality and who you are. Um, those are a few. I just come off the top of my head. I'm also rereading The Way of the Superior Man, hmm. um, which is another really good modern masculine spiritual book for for men to read. So yeah, there's a few. There's actually a lot on there that I haven't read. Atomic Habits and War of Art. Oh, um, th- th- those are my top two, man. Like I, I have highly right recommend. They're, okay. they're, like, <laughs> they're on my list. I just have a list, and then I'm reading some books for interviews. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot to keep. I up read like right five now. to eight at a time. And yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, I love reading. Um, well, Nick, thank you so much for sharing all those books. Uh, before we wrap up, before we end the recording, will you uh, please? Tell listeners where they can find your newsletter, where they can find you on X, and anything else that you would like to share. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Yeah, uh, nickbebo.com, N-I-C-K-B-I-B-E-A-U.com has everything. Um, I have a newsletter, Laughing Stoic Buddha newsletter. Started a second newsletter, which I'm calling Story Showing Sunday. Uh, You can sign up for both. The Story Showing newsletter is just teaching you how to, storytelling tactics, how to tell better stories. Laughing Stoic Buddha is letters to my daughters, stuff on Buddhism, Stoicism. Um, I also have my podcast, which you can get through my website. Um, I post everything on YouTube, and I eventually, as we talked about off recording earlier, will start posting everything back on audio only as well. And then if you really want to connect with me, the main place I hang out is X at right with a W already. Uh, check me out on at right already. Give me a follow. I host a space, sometimes two a week. I post every single day, tell a lot of personal stories. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my whole creative life wrapped up in a bow. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to interview with me today. It's been awesome. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, man. As a, uh, as a lover, a connoisseur of good conversations and good podcasts, I, I mean this when I say great job, dude. This was really, really well done. And uh, I'm going to go back and start listening to some of the other episodes. So thank you. Right on, man. Thanks, Nick. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. 
And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net, where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase, and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at RDTM Podcast. That's A R T I E T M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.